Hi, the Pragmatic Luther with another idea for guitar making jigs for you. Um, it's really nice to be able to get a set of braces all arched and have them nicely consistent. So today I'm going to show you what I use to arch my braces and I'm going to give you some tips on how to make one. I'm not going to go through the process blow by blow because I don't think you really need that. Um, I'm just going to show you basically what I did and a couple of the tricks that I learned along the way. So this is what we're after in the end. It's simple enough, but the question I, I guess would be, just because you got this, how do you get the 30 foot radius, or in this case, a 25 foot or whatever radius you want to put in it? Well, this whole idea relies on the notion that you have a dish radius. Um, this, they work together and you make them so that they work together. If you don't have a dish radius, this is probably not going to help you unless you make radius strips to put under each brace and use those as calls, but that's kind of clumsy to do sometimes. If you don't have a dish radius, I did make a video years ago, I, I believe it's still up, um, on making a dish radius, and there are several other videos out there. And they're not that hard to do at all. You can do them in several different ways. And do not buy one of these. Please don't waste your money buying a dish radius. I, I believe these dish radius things are $75, $80 a piece. And that's just horse hockey. You don't need that. You can make one so much cheaper and it will be just as good and be exactly to your specifications. So anyway, to make this jig is not that tough. I'm going to start with this board. Um, this board needs to be, I would say, two inches longer than your the longest brace that you're likely to arch. Uh, there's no need to go any further than that. Now, this board happens to be a piece of Luan. I think that's a little bit soft for what we're doing here. I'd prefer that you make this thing out of maple or beech or hickory or a piece of white ash. Oak would do the job just fine. Any any good dense hard wood is what you're after. Uh, now, the width of this board is not terribly important, uh, but I would make sure that this is at least four and a half inches wide up to about six because that's going to give you clearance for your clamps and the handles that you're going to need to put on this. The first thing I did was cut a rabbit in this, and I want this rabbit, the remaining portion of the rabbit right here, is that clearly visible? Uh, I want that to be at least three-eighths of an inch thick. Uh, you want to have plenty of surface right here for the bearing of a zero clearance router bit or shaper cutter to follow. Now the depth of the rabbit doesn't really matter. My braces range anywhere from a quarter of an inch to three-eighths of an inch thick. So I just make sure that that's at least a quarter of an inch deep and then let the clamps take up the excess space. You can work that out any way you want to. So what I did was I set up my saw and I cut the rabbit in this fashion. You could I suppose you could turn the board over and you could cut it this way and then readjust and you know do a two-step process but you don't really need to I set this up and did it this way and then kept moving the fence an eighth of an inch and running again move the fence an eighth of an inch and run again until I had the rabbit cleaned out I know that way that this edge and this cut edge are parallel that's reasonably important but not absolutely critical. So now I bring this rabbited board over and I put the rabbited edge of it right down on my radius dish and I want to center it. Uh, you don't need to be real real retentive about that but get it very nicely over a visual over visual center or do some measuring if you want to but it's not super critical because what you're going to have is a 30 foot radius in this case, excuse me, 25 foot, um, no matter what you do. It's just that 
if it's skewed over here, the radius is going to be tilted. If it's skewed here, it's going to be tilted. So reasonably centered is a nice idea. And you can see there's a gap here. And it's touching, obviously, here and here. Well, I'm going to do some tracing. That's why I'm here. So I, do, I just took a piece of pencil and a thin piece of wood and taped this down so that the pencil will just touch here in the center. And I'm going to trace that. Now, I've already traced it here. So I'm going to turn this around and just do it again so that you can kind of see how this goes. And I'm steadying. I've got a I've got a steel angle block back here to steady this. You don't really need to, but it's if it tips, it just makes it that much more difficult to control. And of course, being that this is a radius dish, uh, this angle is not 90 degrees. We know that, but we're not going to get that particular about this. We just want to steady this. So I'm going to trace this. Just put the pencil in there. I hope my hand isn't in the way too much. And away we go with the pencil. And there we have it. Now, of course, I've got that tape down. The sandpaper is going to ruin that tape and wear it out. But you're only doing this once or twice, so it's okay. Now, I don't know if you can see that pencil mark very well or not, but it is there. I can see it very clearly. And you can see that I've got one on this side. I think you can probably see that. But it's there. And as long as you can see it when you make one of these, that's all that's important. So now, what do I do to make this thing? Well, here's the fun and easy part. I'm going to take this over to the bandsaw, and I'm going to cut it out. Well... But how are you going to do it accurately, they say? Easy. I cut this on the bandsaw, and I did it off camera because this is not a bandsaw show. Um, but I cut as close to the line as I could without getting too, uh, too technical about it. I'm going to avoid the line because I'm going to refine right here. This is what makes this jig so useful and so easy to do because I've got this roughed out. And by the way, what if you don't have a bandsaw? You could still do this. Take a hand plane and you start where you need to waste the most material out here and back here. And you could hand plane that down. Are you clumsy with a hand plane? You'd be surprised. If you practice this, you'll get better and better and you can do it. It's not that tough. But what I'm going to do now to perfect this is I'm going to put it right on that radius dish. And I'm going to sand that radius in there. Holding pretty square is important. You want to take that into account. And you can monitor your progress. I can see saw marks on here, so I know I'm not done. But you could run a pencil line or chalk down that edge to track your progress. And I'm just about there. Now I'm not going to do all of this in front of the camera because it's just a waste of your time. But I think if you look at that curve, if you can see that well enough, with the exception of a flat spot right there, this is already pretty well formed up. So you can see it doesn't take long to do. And the beauty of this thing, again, is that because I refined this edge on this radius dish, they will match. So that when your braces are arched and you glue your braces down on your top or your back, they're going to come together because they were made one to mate the other. I completed the sanding of this radius off camera and I wanted to just come back and point out that the depth of this rabbit that you're going to cut is equal to the maximum height of whatever brace you're going to cut with it. Um, that's, it should be obvious, but maybe not. So if your braces uh, 
if you start with a brace three quarters of an inch tall, for example, or five eighths, whatever you start with, then you want that rabbet to be that depth. And obviously it's going to lose depth here and here at its maximum, progressing to losing theoretically nothing here. Now that may vary just a hair, um, but I rip my bracing stock a little bit tall because I'm gonna flatten it down once it's glued down. I'm gonna go over that with a hand plane. If it's up too high, I'm gonna bring it down where I want it anyway. And you are going to uh, scallop them off and, and possibly scallop the braces anyway. So uh, this is simple enough to do. Uh, our next step would be to mount some handles on this. Now, these handles on mine are just, these are, they're left over uh, from office chairs is all they are. But you can put any kind of handle on these things you want. See, I mounted these with T-nuts in here and a nut on top to keep those nice and tight. But you don't need anything that slick and exotic. Now my clamps, these are the uh, Desteco brand clamps which I kind of like, but you don't need, again, anything that slick and exotic. You can make clamps out of wood that you can screw down with a wing nut. There's any number of ways you can do that. The important thing is that you have handles that are back away from the cutting edge and that uh, you can get a good grip on this because you want to maintain nice control over this. You can use this with your router table or with a shaper, and I'll demonstrate that momentarily. I have marked a center on my brace, and I've got it in the jig and it's clamped down. Now, as I mentioned, you could make any kind of clamps you want uh, rather than buy these if you care to, but I find that having adjustable clamps is just very handy. If you don't have adjustable clamps, you can put thin shims under there. Or you can make your own clamp with enough give in it so that you can accommodate several brace thicknesses. So this relies, of course, on the idea that I have down here a bearing uh, that rides against the curved edge of the jig and the shaper cutter does the cutting. The same thing would occur with the top bearing router bit. I'll say once more, um, if you haven't heard me say it, I much prefer a shaper over a router table of any kind, which I won't get into right now, but uh, to me, a shaper is a far superior machine to any router table you can come up with. So anyway, we're just going to run this through and arch this brace. If you have an awful lot of waste above the jig, you can trace that with a pencil, and you can take it over to the bandsaw and slash that off a little ways from the line, and it makes things a little bit easier, but not terribly necessary. You do have to be careful, however, that what's on the left side of the center, you are potentially working up into the grain of the brace stock. So care must be taken when you route this, or excuse me, when you shape it. I tend um, to want to feed really in the wrong direction sometimes to try and make that a little easier, essentially doing a climb cut. But a lot of caution is necessary when you're doing something like that. But anyway, let's see how this works. And the last thing that I can do, if I'm not satisfied with the way that feels, if I feel any mill marks in there, or any sort of variation that I don't care for, I can refine that right here. I can put that brace right on my radius dish. And if you give that just a few strokes, like so, that brace is perfectly smooth and it's now ready to glue down. And it is at a 30 foot radius. Now, something I mentioned before, I said, make your own radius dishes. You're afraid you might not get a perfect 30 foot radius or 25 foot or whatever you're aiming at. Don't worry about it because if you've made the thing properly, it will be consistent. Nobody really cares if your 30 foot radius dish is at 29 feet or even at 28 or if your 25 happens to be 27 or 23. The point is 
that you have a consistent dish and you match your braces to it. So there's the basics on how to make a brace arching jig. It's simple enough to do. Just remember to make it out of a pretty dense wood. Make sure that whatever you use for handles, they can be wood, anything you want them to be, but make sure that they are sturdy and keep your hands back away from the cutting area. Um, remember to make this board wide enough so that you have that clearance. This clearance that I have here is, it's adequate, but uh, it probably could be nicer if this was back another half, three quarters of an inch maybe. And again, clamps, if you want to buy toggle clamps, they're great because if the jig wears out or you change your mind, you've always got the toggle clamps to use. But if you don't have these and you don't want to buy these, that's fair enough. Make your own clamps. It's not hard to do. So there you go. I hope this has been helpful. I am the Pragmatic Luther, Kevin Ledoux at Ledoux Guitars. And I hope you'll put a like on the video and subscribe to my channel. Thanks again.